Good evening, everyone. How does the Christian in 2018 view the consumption of alcohol? That's the question that we want to answer. It doesn't take long reading in the New Testament or even the Old Testament to see that God condemns drunkenness as a, as a sin. But what about just having a drink every once in a while? What about just having a beer after you mow the grass or having a glass of wine at dinner or a mixed drink at the end of the day? Is that, is that something that we need to be concerned about? Is that something that the Lord is concerned about? Um, I want to convince you that it is. And I, I've tried to do, I've tried to, to work through this myself and do a word study on the word wine. And uh, that didn't help because the word wine uh, in the Hebrew and also in the Greek can mean anything from fresh grape juice to intoxicating drink. And so to do a word study is not really that helpful. Um, if you wanted to see what wine is being talked about, whether that's intoxicating drink or fresh grape juice, then it's largely uh, dependent upon the circumstance or the, the, the context of the passage. So that's not going to help us, so we're not going to go that route. And uh, I've been putting this off for too long, and the only way I can preach this is to approach this topic on a personal level. And so, brethren, I love you. I hope that you love me. I know that you do. You've shown that to me. And so I'm going to put myself out there a little bit. I don't like to do this because um, it, it's, it's uncomfortable, but um, I'll, I'll do it anyway because I feel like it'll help. Uh, I became a Christian several years ago, and of course, as you all have who have become children of God, there are things that you have to put off. As you put on Jesus, you're putting off certain things, and this is one of the things that I struggled for a long time to put off, far too long to put off. I had to deal with this issue. I remember making the step to become a Christian and understanding what that meant and picking up the cross and, and making choices. And I knew I, would get, I was going to have to deal with this issue. And so I studied and studied and studied. And I dealt, I, I saw an, an evolution in my thinking as I continually uh, mature in, in my faith and my walk with Jesus. First, you know, I thought, well, I, I, know, the, I know the Bible says drunkenness is wrong, so I just won't get drunk. I can still drink, I just won't get drunk. And then I'd study for a few months on it or something like that, and my conscience would convict me, and I'd read passages about influence, and I'd think, well, I can't go to bars anymore, so I'm not going to do that. I can't get drunk, I can't go to bars anymore, but I can still have a couple people over and, and drink a beer every now and then. And then I would study and study and pray and, and grow, and my conscience was still convicting me. I thought, you know what, I, I, can't, I can't really be drinking around other people, so I'll just... It's not wrong if I just have a beer every once in a while alone at home or, or maybe, you know, if it's just me and Rachel. And then the same thing happened. I'll tell you what, brethren, I was not satisfied. And I remember in 2010 in New York City taking that last beer and looking at it and saying, you know what, this doesn't even taste good anymore. And I remember pouring it down the drain and making a covenant with myself and with God on that day that I would never, never, drink alcohol again. And it is not, it is not because I don't think about it. And it's not because I'm not tempted by it. I still am tempted by it after eight years. But I've kept that covenant with myself and with God. And I want to explain to you six reasons how I came to that conclusion and how, uh, hopefully, give you motivation uh, to make that same conclusion and how I stuck with it. And these are in order from the weakest arguments to the strongest arguments, okay? Reason number one why I don't drink alcohol is because I live in the 21st century in America and not the first century in Palestine. We know that drunkenness is condemned in the Bible. Galatians 5 and verse 21, drunkenness is a work of the flesh. When we are being guided by our lusts and our flesh, 
then drunkenness is going to follow. This is one of the things, certainly, that God condemns. We have example after example after example in the Bible of people who screwed up their lives because of drunkenness. We have Noah, we have Lot, we have Nabal, we have Amnon, Belshazzar, Herod. So many examples, too many to name. But then you've got some other passages. And I remember working through this and, and reading some of these passages that seem to suggest that drinking wine wasn't condemned. You've got a passage like Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 26 that the Israelites as they were journeying could buy wine or, or strong drink. You've got passages in the book of Ecclesiastes that deal with this. How the preacher is talking about, well, life is short, you're going to die, so enjoy your food and enjoy your drink. And one of those things was drinking wine. You've got a passage like uh, Luke chapter 7, verses 33 and 34, where John the Baptist, he, he wasn't drinking or eating, but the people rejected him, and Jesus was drinking and eating, and they call him a drunkard and a glutton. And you've got John chapter 2 where Jesus turns water into wine. Or 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23 where Paul is actually telling Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach. And so I'm dealing with this. I'm reading these passages. And I'm trying to balance this out. If Israel could drink wine, if Jesus could drink wine, and Paul and Timothy, uh, Paul said Timothy could drink wine, well, how, how can I not drink wine? And how can I tell other people not to? simply because wine in the ancient world is not like the wine that you can buy at Kroger or Walmart today. Uh, the average alcoholic content, the percentage per volume, if you've got a glass of wine, 11.5, 11.6, depending, this is just an average, about 11 or 12 percent of that alcoholic or that liquid volume is alcoholic. And it goes through this process of fermentation, right? You, you take grapes, and there's yeast that exists on the, uh, on the skin of those grapes, and you crush those grapes, and when the yeast that naturally exists on the skin of the grapes mixes with the sugars that naturally occur in a grape, a process happens called fermentation. And it's very slow. But given enough time, that, that drink will become fermented, will become intoxicating. And it will cap out at about 11.6% alcoholic percentage by, by volume. But this process can be slowed if you take that grape juice and you put it in a sealed, in a sealed container. Well, here come the Israelites. In Palestine, for, for generations, these, these vineyards were a very important part of their culture. And they were living in a very dry and arid place. And clean water was not very abundant. But these vineyards that God blessed them with were very, very productive. And so if you were a Jew living in the ancient world, then you basically had two options. You could drink water if you could find it and it was clean, or you could drink grape juice. And like we pointed out with that process of fermentation, the good stuff was the fresh stuff, but you leave it sit long enough, nature's going to take over, fermentation is going to take over. And so what they would do is they would dilute that wine where the alcoholic content would be something around 2 or 3 percent, less than a can of beer today. And so to get drunk on the wine that you read about in the Bible, you would truly have to be a glutton. You'd have to be chugging this stuff by the gallon. I'm not living in the first century. I'm living in the 21st century. And so second, the wine was a medicinal necessity too to these ancient people. They didn't have the kind of medicine that we had. And in, in a cold winter night, if you read Clement, and Clement talks about this in the second century, that wine was a necessity to keep your body warm. Well, I'm not living in the first century. I'm living in the 21st century. And I'm living in America. <laughs> we are spoiled for choice. We've got, a, I've got several taps of, of I could just... Turn a handle and I've got clean and fresh water. What a blessing that is. And I don't have the excuse to take a little wine from my stomach for medicinal purposes because of our health care system, because of all the medicine that's available to us. Now, I realize this point is not conclusive. And it, it depends on historical context, but this helps me. I don't live in the first century in Palestine. I live in America in the 21st century. 
And so I can't take a passage out of context and just apply it across the board to the world that I'm living in today. My alcoholic grandpa, who beat the living tar out of my father and caused my father never to take a drink of alcohol, he would pull me aside. He, he, he cleaned up his, his, his life and he joined AA and he stopped drinking and all of that, but the damage was done. And he, he would tell me, out of all the things he could tell me, out of all the advice he could give me about not drinking, you know what he said to me? There's so many other things to drink. That's a, it's a, not a strong reason, it's a, but a pretty good reason. I live in the 21st century in America, not the first century. Reason number two, because royal priests don't drink. Because royal priests don't drink. Go back to the book of Leviticus in chapter 10, please. Leviticus in chapter 10. I'd like to read a, a passage there. And you're probably not familiar with this passage. You're probably more familiar with the passage before it. Let's start in verse 8. Leviticus 10 and verse 8. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying... Drink no wine or strong drink, you or your sons with you, lest you go into the tent of meeting, or when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Now, those of you who are familiar with Leviticus chapter 10, what is the story that you normally think about? It's about what happened just before. Do you remember Nadab and Abihu, the other sons of Aaron? They were consumed with fire for waltzing right into the presence of God with no regard at all for His holiness. Now, why does this passage come right after that episode? That leads me to draw to either one of two conclusions. Either this is completely random, it has nothing to do with it, or this was put in here as a response to the things that just happened. And Nadab and Abihu did the kind of thing that they did because they were drunk, because they'd been drinking. But here's what we know for sure. When priests in the Old Testament were serving in the temple, alcohol, wine, or strong drink was absolutely prohibited. Well, what does this mean for me and you in 2018? You know where I'm going with this. 1 Peter chapter 2. What does Peter call us? 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 9, Peter says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Every believer is a priest ministering in the temple of God. Revelation chapter 1, in verse 6, Jesus made us a kingdom priests to His God and Father, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Not only are we priests ministering in the temple of God, we are the temple of God. The temple in the Old Testament was foreshadowing this temple that we make up as Christians. 1 Peter 2 in verse 5, You yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus has enabled us to become priests, a royal priesthood. And we're not like the Levites, Guys, we're not going into the, like Nadab and Abihu or like the sons of Aaron, we're not going into the, the, the tabernacle a few times a year. Oh no. Your life now, as a priest, as a royal priest, is to be giving of yourself. We are serving not just in the temple, we are the temple of God. Royal priests did not drink alcohol when they were ministering and neither should we. And we are continually offering ourselves as sacrifices, as holy living sacrifices, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, to God in this living temple where we're all as stones being built up. And so if, it just reason follows, if 
Serving God is my life. And I am ministering to God continually. Why would I want to jeopardize my ministry with wine or strong drink? Reason number three. Wisdom strongly and clearly advises against it. Go to the book of Proverbs for this one. The book of Proverbs. Let's start in, ver in chapter 1, okay? Proverbs chapter 1. Look at verse 20. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. Look at verse 23. Here's what wisdom is shouting at the top of her lungs. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make words known to you. Look at verse 25. What if we don't? What if we don't heed the voice of wisdom because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof? I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. And wisdom is not silent on this issue. It's very vocal, very clear about the consumption of alcohol. And so what does wisdom have to say about drinking? Really, wisdom doesn't say anything that you don't already know after looking at a drunk person. Chapter 20, verse 1. Chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink, a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. What's the opposite of being wise? Okay. Chapter 23. Chapter 23. Verse 29. Wisdom asks the question, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Well, who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine, that's who. Those who go to try mixed wine, that's who. So what does wisdom say? Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things. Your heart will utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea. What sense does that make? It's a good place to take a nap in the Pacific Ocean. Like one who lies on the top of a mast. Oh, up here, you know. I'll just take a nap at the top of a mast. How's that going to end? Here's what the drunk says. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. And he's so led astray by strong drink, he doesn't think to stop. No, he says, when, when shall I awake? I must have another drink. And so some people's answer to this, and this is my answer. For so long. Well, don't tarry long over wine, right? Isn't that what verse 30 says? Just, just drink a little bit. Don't, don't drink a whole lot. Don't drink too much. That's not wisdom's advice. Wisdom's advice is in verse 31. Don't even look at it. Don't even look at it. Don't even go down that road. And you say, now hold on a minute. Wisdom is telling me not to even look at it, let alone drink it. Well, what about old Timothy? You know the passage I'm talking about. 1 Timothy 5. Go to 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5. And keep your finger in Proverbs. Sorry if you've already went to Timothy. But 1 Timothy 5. And here's what Paul says to Timothy. Verse 23. No longer drink only water. But use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. No longer drink any water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Now, why did Paul have to command Timothy to drink a little wine? 
Look at the verse. Why did Paul have to command Timothy to drink a little wine? Brethren, because Timothy was in the habit of drinking only what? Water. That's what Timothy was drinking. Abraham's ale. Right? He was in the habit of drinking water. Why? Look at the three words preceding verse 23. Keep yourself pure. That's what Timothy was trying to do. He was an evangelist laboring with Christians, much like I, I, I am with you. And Paul tells this evangelist in chapter 4, in verse 12, don't let anyone look down on you because of your youth. In fact, here's what you need to do, Timothy. Set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith. What else? In purity. In purity. That's why he was drinking only water. And Paul has to say, listen, you've got a medical problem. It's okay for you to have a, a little bit. But it's ir so ironic that people run to this passage to justify drinking alcohol when that's not what this passage is teaching. This passage is teaching that Timothy should use a little wine for medicinal use. He allowed him to drink a little wine with two, qualifi two qualifiers. You can drink it only sparingly and only for medicinal purposes. Now, is wine a medical necessity in 2018? Not when we have Pepto-Bismol. No. <laughs> that joke belongs to Nick Petrie, by the way. Yeah, I won't claim it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. James says, if you lack wisdom, then just ask God, and He will give it to you. Without reproach, He'll give you, He'll grant you that wisdom. Does anybody here in this assembly have enough wisdom? You think you're capped out on wisdom? Nobody here, right? When we live in a world unlike the ancient world, when clean water was hard to come by, when, when the, your choices were either water or wine, and drinking water is no longer a medical necessity, why would I keep drinking something that wisdom is shouting at the top of her lungs telling me this is leading you into sin? It's leading you away from God. It's leading you to make bad choices, dangerous choices. We're not going to read all these passages. Proverbs 21, verse 17, if you're writing them down. 23, verses 19 through 21. Why would I... Drink, put something in my body that the Holy Spirit's wisdom is directly connecting to poverty. I guess if you want to become poor. Proverbs 23, verses 29 through 35, we read that a moment ago. Why would I drink something that the Holy Spirit's wisdom is directly connecting to a destroyed life, to sorrow, to woe, to pain, to wounds without cause? Proverbs 31, verses 4 and 5, the words of King Lemuel. Why would I want to put something in my body that the Holy Spirit's wisdom is teaching me impairs my judgment? Well, I'll, I'll tell you why. Only if you were a fool who despises the wisdom of God. I don't drink because wisdom, God's wisdom, teaches me not to. Number four, because disciples are called to sobriety. Two passages, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And beginning in verse 6. Paul has just got done saying that we are children of the daytime. And Paul says in verse 6, So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Now, He's, this, these are metaphors for how we live our life. Are we living our, our lives awake? As the young people say, are you woke? That sounds so awful coming out of my mouth. <laughs> right. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. We're not living in the nighttime. We're living in, in the light of Jesus Christ, the gospel. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. 
Now, turn over to 1 Peter, two passages in 1 Peter. And these passages, you'll find one at the beginning of 1 Peter and one at the end of 1 Peter, and they're acting like bookends. They're framing the book here, and they're calling us to sobriety. 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the re revelation of Jesus Christ. At the end of the book, in chapter 5, in verse 8, Chapter 5 and verse 8, Peter says, Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We are fighting a battle every single day for our very souls. And when something stands in the way and hinders my sobriety, I am gambling with my very soul. And it's, it's really bad when even our culture, even our culture knows this. Don't drink and drive. Why? Because when you're driving, it's serious. Because you have your life in your hands, and you have the life of the people in the car, and everyone on the road, it's very serious. And so we know that alcohol impairs our judgment. And so don't drink and drive. You've got to be sober. You've got to be vigilant. Well, how much more when we're in a battle for our souls? How much more when we're journeying to the promised land and we can't go to the left or to the right? We've got to stay on the straight and narrow. How much more when there is a lion seeking every single opportunity to devour us? Say, well, don't get drunk. We can all agree on that one. And so some people say, well, you know, well, the issue comes when... When do I actually get drunk, though? When, when, when do I stop being sober? Is that the right question to be asking when there's a devil or when there's a, a, a lion that, that's going to pounce on you and eat your head off? No. That's not the right question. That's not a, a mature disciple answer. The disciple answer, asks the question, when am I sober? That's what I've got to be concerned with. The Bible is teaching me to be sober Peter and Paul don't say, well, you're in a battle for your soul, so you better make sure you stay relatively sober. No, no. You stay sober. You be watchful. You be vigilant. I can't do that if I'm drunk. Well, what, what, when does a person become drunk? The fact is, as soon as alcohol enters my bloodstream, it begins to affect my judgment. And I don't need a passage to tell me when I'm drunk. Scripture doesn't say at what point a person crosses over from sobriety into drunkenness. It doesn't take a medical professional or a Greek scholar to understand the more alcohol I put into my body, the less sober I'm going to be. The more I drink, the more drunk I'm going to be. And the further away from God and wisdom I'm going to be. I don't need help acting stupid? Do you? And I surely don't need help acting sinful and hurting other people and destroying other people who are made in the image of God and destroying myself, the one for whom Christ died. We need to have our wits about us when we're facing temptation. Alcohol is not going to help me. It's only going to hurt me. Number five, because contentment is found only in Jesus. I know for a fact there are probably some of you here who have, this has crossed your mind about drinking. Well, can I, can I just have a, a drink or two? Would that, would that be okay? Well, can I ask you a question? Why do you want to drink? What are the motives behind that? Do you think you're missing out on something? What do you think that you're going to find when you go down that road? Well, some people drink to forget. Some people drink to dull the pain. Some people drink to take away worry and anxiety in their life. Some people drink to find fulfillment or happiness or, or to make them relax or to give them peace. Have you ever heard of anybody who has found any of those things in a bottle. 
Talk to anybody. No one has found those things. Those are the promises that alcohol makes, but it never fulfills. You get anxiety, not peace. You get sorrow instead of joy. You get slavery, not freedom. Drinking has never delivered on her promises. But you know who always delivers on his promises? Jesus. Every single one. Every single promise Jesus will fulfill. Through Jesus' Spirit, He is giving us love, and He's giving us joy, and He's giving us peace, and kindness, and goodness, and self-control. And through His cross, He's taking away my pain. He's taking away my worry. He's taking away my sorrow. I don't need anything other than Jesus to be content. I'm not looking forward to Friday night. Because Jesus is with me right now. Jesus is my life. Colossians 3 and verse 3, For you have died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. He is my life. And to live is Christ, but to die is, is, is even far better. He's everything to me. There's nothing that can supplant Him. There's nothing that can add to the joy that you have in Jesus. Certainly not a drink, or something that you eat. Our delight is in Him. We don't have to go searching for something to enhance our lives or, or to fill us up because Jesus came down from heaven and He searched for us. And when He ascended back into heaven, He sent His Holy Spirit to fill us up. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Paul says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is what I want to be influenced by. That's going to lead me to joy. That's going to lead me to peace and the, the wonderful fruit of the Spirit. It's going to move me toward God, justice and righteousness. And, and this beer, this... this, this, this a glass of wine, this mixed drink, or whatever it might be, that's only going to draw me away. True contentment is found in Jesus. And the greatest reason of all, the greatest reason of all, that, that after eight years I haven't touched alcohol, is love. Romans 13. Romans 13. In verse 10... Stephen read for us in verse 10, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is about sacrificing. Love is about putting other people's interests ahead of my own. And as Christians, as disciples, we all wield influence. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And so what, what constrains me from ever taking a sip of alcohol ever again is, is, should be my love for you. I'm getting very attached to this high school class. Very attached. I love them dearly, more and more each day. And for their sake alone, I will never touch it again. Because I don't want them to go down that way. I want to be a good example for them. I know where that leads. I don't want them to destroy their lives. There could be somebody here who's struggling with alcoholism right now. Well, for your sake, I love you. How would you feel? Would you, would you weaken if you saw me drinking? Well, I can handle it. You can't. Sorry, buddy. Our love for one another ought to constrain us. This is the biggest reason, for me at least. I'll tell you what, brethren can argue until they are blue in the face whether they have a right to drink, and they can cherry-pick these verses and say, well, it isn't a sin if I have one little drink. That's not going to work on me. I know what Paul says about love in Romans chapter 14 and verse 21. It is not good to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. And so, much, so many times we're hung up on this question, well, is it wrong? Is it wrong? Is it wrong? Listen, that's a good question as far as it goes, but that's not the only question we need to be asking. How about is it loving? How about does it encourage somebody? 
Does it draw them closer to the Lord? Discipleship and love is about sacrificing your own rights for the betterment of somebody else. And if drinking is my right, I'm not saying it is, but people argue that it is. If drinking is my right, then I would gladly forfeit that right to keep other people from stumbling. We need to stop turning the Bible into a rule book by sifting through Scripture to find loopholes so that we can do what we want. Instead, we should be looking at our neighbor, at our brother, at our sister, at our children, and saying, is it wise? Is it loving? Is it helpful? Is it encouraging to them? Does it reflect holiness, humility, faith? Is it selfless? Does it glorify God? Is it drawing me closer to Jesus? Am I being sober? Am I being watchful? These are better questions to ask than is it wrong. Is it wrong is a good, is a good question. Don't get me wrong. But a more mature question is, is it loving? And close your Bibles and open your songbooks, brethren, to 269. I'll tell you what, as much as I hate alcohol, there are times when I would very much like to have a drink. But these things that we discussed, they hold me back and they remind me of why I made that choice eight years ago. Because the memory is still fresh of my life during that time. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. Those who are led astray by it are not wise. It's funny, you know, the Lord will forgive us, but He will not remove the memories of our sins. And I think that's on purpose, brethren. Because the shameful things that you do when you're drunk will stay with you forever. Do you want to be the temple of God do you want to be wise? Do you want to love your neighbor? Do you want to find peace in this life? Do you want to be content? Do you want to be ready when the Lord comes back? I, I hope my aim th this evening has been to persuade you, if you have alcohol in your home, to go home tonight and you pour all that disgusting filth down your drain. Because it's not going to help you or anyone else get to heaven. And if you want to, if you want to continue drinking because you feel entitled to it or because you feel like you're missing out, I'll call you a fool. You are not walking in wisdom. My prayer for you is the same prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesians. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. God wants to fill you up with His Holy Spirit. If you'd like the gift of the Spirit tonight, and you want forgiveness that only God can give, then we ask you to respond to the Gospel right now as we sing this song. <coughs>